Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, for the introduction. Uh, right at the beginning, I uh, must express my gratitude. Uh, pardon me, Professor Das, before uh, we begin our conversation. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Uh, Not audible? Uh, Please bring it nearer. Okay. Uh, is it all right? Okay. Um, I'm beholden to LBD for uh, giving me uh, the honor of uh, sitting beside two uh, preeminent uh, authors uh, uh, in India who are also known abroad, who are widely read uh, in uh, translation. Uh, so that's an honor um, that uh, LBD has uh, called me, uh, for which I'm uh, indeed grateful. Uh, whenever I come to a book fair, you know, it's a uh, mood of celebration that, that uh, overwhelms me. You know, the, these are the days of uh, doomsday predictions of global warming, uh, you know, that uh, there will be no more book industry, all the languages in India are going to perish and so on and so forth. And yet, when you come to a book exhibition uh, like this, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, such a mega uh, a book fair, uh, international book fair of this kind in uh, Delhi or in um, you know uh, state capitals like Bhuvaneshwar, where uh, thousands of people throng and they uh, browse these books and they buy these books. And I have uh, actually heard of uh, you know the statistics of uh, the large number of books which are actually sold. This in sharp contrast to what one hears from uh, many other people, you know, who say that the book industry is going to die. Some of the publishers I know also say that, you know, the, the book industry is going to die in the, in the era of the Kindle and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, uh, I think all of us should uh, share this mood of celebration when we come here. Uh, Professor Manoj Das, uh, before uh, I begin, um, uh, though we have met uh, many times before, uh, I haven't told you about my uh, how I have grown up with you. I was in school uh, several decades ago when for my, some mischief that I may have committed, I won a prize. And that uh, prize happened to a book. And it's uh, the first book that I ever received as a gift and it, it, the title was Samudra Rakshuda. That's a book that you had written. And I was a you know, tiny little school boy. That is how I began. And then um, about eight or ten years later, uh, I, was, I was playing cricket with a friend. And this friend of mine comes and tells me, uh, Sumanyu, do you know? Uh, there is a story published by you know, Illustrated Weekly of India called The Abu Man. It's such a wonderful story. You know, to be published in the illustrated weekly of India was something, you know, that was unheard of. And for an Odia author to be published there. So that was the second uh, milestone in my association with you, Professor Das. Uh, and then the th uh, third one was when I joined as a young lecturer in a college in Odisha. Uh, you know, we, we uh, discussed uh, you know, Odia literature and one of my colleagues from the department said, uh, I strongly believe that uh, Professor uh, uh, Manoj Das, Manoj Das is the greatest Indian short story writer after Tagore. So, you know, these, this is how I grew up. And then when I was doing research of the kind that uh, uh, Dr. Kumar just described to you, uh, I would uh, find the time to, uh, to uh, write short pieces on uh, uh, your work. You know, there has been a long association with you and uh, as you know my father was also a short story writer and the magazines, the very magazines where his stories would appear that we, I still have many of those magazines which I browse from time to time. So uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be with you Professor Das uh, and uh, you know I have uh, a few I had a few uh, questions in my mind, many of which have been answered by you in this particular preface uh, that you have written, a wonderful preface where which uh, we have already, uh, the summary of which we have heard from Mr. Uh, Sadhguru Now, uh, one of the questions that comes to 
into my mind. Yeah. Of course, I will raise some of the issues. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, request you to elaborate on some of the issues that you have raised in the preface. But before that, uh, I would like to know from you what had, what were the shaping influences on your writing when you began uh, in the early years of your writing career, particularly the short story. Of course, you have uh, heard of uh, uh, the Panchatantra, Vishnu Sharma and so on. But, you know, um, I believe critics have talked about the influence of two American authors, James Thorburn, who also happened to be a cartoonist, and William Serwai. Um, I think, uh, you know, the avid readers of your wonderful short story would like to know a little bit about the shaping influence that, uh, you know, uh, came to you in the formative years. Dear sir, Sathomadhubhanti, my friend, Professor Subhanyu Sapkotiji, my able editor, Kumar Vikramji, my friend, Dr. Subhar Gavit, Narasandar Babu, dear friends. Well, never in my life I had been subjected to this kind of situation when publicly I have to confess my trade secret. <laughs> so, no, actually, I have always avoided the proposal for launching of any my, of my books, but National Book Trust is something very special for me. It is a national institution. And as you have already come to know that I am one of the largest selling authors, Manas Vandana, who has given you the statistics from 1970 till today. Hence, I really, with a delight, I acknowledge my gratitude to National Book Trust for having given me this opportunity to present during the launching of my book, my latest book and my probably the highest book, I should say. Now, when you ask me, Professor Sarkoti, about the influences which shaped my writing, the first spontaneous idea that comes to mind, the truth that dawns upon me is it is more than influence the inspiration. Probably two things work simultaneously on my creative mind. I say creative mind because I believe just as some people are born with certain aptitude, somebody has a fondness for music, somebody has for sports, somebody has for some other kind of art, paintings for example, there is a kind of ingrained element in someone's consciousness when he is born, which may be responsible for making him receptive to certain inspirations which come, but influence certainly molds the inspiration into an articulated form. And those influences were, believe me, my dear friends, the village in which I was born, its environment was the most charming environment I had ever seen in my life. My house was the last house on that part of the country. In front of it, there were green meadows studded with palm trees. Two natural lakes, one filled with red lotuses, with another with white lotuses, and they never mixed. Beyond that, sand dunes covered by creepers, bearing very juicy berries, and then the expansive sea. This was a beautiful area, but it is no longer so. Overcrowded, lakes are dead, and the Sand dunes have been covered with casual trees for sake of economy. It is a different area altogether alien to myself. But this beautiful influence of the area on me was also contrasted by a terrible cyclone resulting in a heavy bringing the misfortune to me to see my dear faces, my familiar ones, 
just dying before my eyes. You can't imagine today what a famine meant to the British India. No communication, no telephone, no radio, no kind of touch with the external world, the outside world, beyond the famine struck locality. Can you imagine today on my way to my upper primary school, beyond a half ground, a school which housed a temporary relief kitchen for starving people to get a handful of rice and some dal. On my way to the school, I have seen an old couple in their 70s or probably early 80s try to reach the relief center. By the time coming back from the school, I have seen them dead, unable to have even reach the school and surrounded by jackals and vultures. You can't imagine today this kind of scene. Times have changed so much for the better, in spite of many other curses still prevailing to dominate our life. But this is the situation. So my experience of the wonder that was by nature was contrasted equally by the horror that was the famine and the death of multitudes and above that also my house was twice planted mine was an immigrant house it was planted by gangs of ferocious darkness leaving us proper a few hours of plundering you see those days there was no back balance of people everything was gold your wealth is measured in terms of gold and all was gone couple of hours. So I believe this diametrically opposite realities surrounding our life must have touched me very deeply, must have left such an impression in me. When the inspiration comes, I have been able to evaluate life in both its aspect of heaven and aspect of hell. And one thing is certain that I have never myself voted for the hell. I have always voted for the heaven. I have always believed within myself that this beautiful creation was not meant just for tragedy. There is something evolving out of man, something in the future, something that is tomorrow, maybe many lives after our life. But that alone can justify the whole creation. That faith has sustained me in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you sir. Professor Das, you must excuse uh, someone like me who is an academic. Uh, you know, in sharp contrast to the wonderful, evocative uh, uh, narrative, uh, which is what uh, is uh, so charming about your stories. Uh, we academics uh, tend to ask very prosaic questions. There was a tradition of uh, critical appreciation maybe 40, 50 years ago when the uh, so called critics. Uh, uh, Either appreciated and shared, uh, you know, the, the creative joy of the author, or uh, you know, they would engage um, in a very interesting sort of way with the, the work of the author. But these days, you know, we tend to ask very precise questions. So, uh, so we say uh, uh, that in response to my question, uh, is it perhaps uh, wise to say that is so-called influences on your art? Where incident, you did not uh, deliberately cultivate your art by having models in front of you. Rather, you allowed uh, your, your sensibility to respond to the kind of experiences, the uh, the uh, flora and fauna of uh, you know the, the place where you grew up, uh, the stories you heard from uh, friends, villagers, your grandmother and mother, and so on and so forth. And that is how your your uh, creativity was shaped, and it is for dull critics like us to, to uh, recognize, you know, uh, similarities between your art and the art that uh, we routinely read uh, elsewhere. Uh, perhaps uh, you can respond to that. Excellent, Professor Sarpathi. Yours is not a question, but an observation, but it is very appropriate observation. 
I have really used these influences as role as, as elements to build up the body of my story. But the core of my story, the soul of my story, or the theme of my story, that is always been something which a sort of inspiration has been planted in my creative self. It is the human psyche which I have tried to bring out, but then a soul must also have a mind, a vital, a body, physical body. So that is how all the influences have been used to give the physical form, the constitution to the real truth or soul of my story. Thank you, Dr. Yes, uh, you know, it is that sense of place. It is your sense of place that uh, is a uh, characteristic feature of many of your stories. Whether it's a story like whether it be a ghost or you know the, the uh, missing uh, the mystery of the missing cat or uh, a night in the life of the bear, and many of these stories there are places which are described. You little boys who are playing, you know, in the uh, story uh, called uh, you know where where we are ghost. There are descriptions of hillocks. There are descriptions of forests uh, which. Uh, are not, uh, you know, created out of abstraction, but, you know, they, they, if, uh, an author won't be able to create such an atmosphere without having actually been a part of uh, scenes like those. Uh, would you agree with uh, my observation that, uh, uh, you know, the, the setting of your place, though you don't have a uh, play, place name like Malaguri or R.K. Narayan, it's quite clear that in all your stories, there is um, a landscape, uh, there are places which uh, belong to uh, one particular area. Uh, you haven't named them. There is no uh, transfictional place called Malguri or the Wessex, as in the case of Hali. But, uh, you know, they are all rooted. And since I have also been in those parts of this, uh, I feel that, you know, the strength of many of your stories comes from you know, that sense of place. Yes. Once again I must say that I agree with you that these locations, be it a clump of tree, be it a bush, be it a lake, be it a hill, be it a river or a bullet, wherever I have looked at them, I have always felt, now that you ask this question, I must confess, that I have always felt something more than the hill, more than the tree, more than the ritual, as if a living vibrant force behind them. Probably that is how our ancestors saw or felt in a river a deity. Sorry, Gonga. sorry, I was asked to interrupt you. What I uh, feel is that you know there are many incidents which are happening in many of your stories. Uh, they are they are all around the fantastic, the mysterious, but they are so convincing because the place is real, the setting is so real. That is what I feel when I go through your stories. Right, absolutely. I am I am happy that a critic like you has caught the right point. It is something thrilling to me really. Now uh, today there are many praises up there and estimates up there. But very fine, the views are there, but mostly superficial. But this is an observation which should actually be remembered by any student of the are doing, he is doing here, and to learn me, many are doing today. Now, I always believe that there isn't any dichotomy between the matter and the spirit. I always believe, even if I am not conscious of my belief, I believe that there is a living spirit behind every physical manifestation of nature. And as I said, when I look at the river, probably I always felt something more living than the simple flow of the water. When I look at the hill, I always felt like a guardian deity, you see, looking over a small village or a locality. A floating cloud also gave me a sense of a blessing which is just going past over our head. Now certainly, this conviction of the living 
in the what appeared to be nothing to me. Automatically, Prabhupada comes into my description of these things. Even though I don't say that it's a living piece of cloud, or it's a living stream of rivulet, or it's a living forest. But my own conviction must be coming apparent in my description, and that must be making some difference. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Das. stories of yours where uh, the characters uh, come alive. Uh, many, many stories of course, uh, you know, we have such uh, characters, but uh, there are certain characters where, uh, where you feel, maybe you have seen a man like that somewhere, but you know, the way you treat them and uh, the narrative which you build around uh, these characters uh, is simply uh, breathtaking. And once you start reading those stories, you know, this is what I have noticed in many of your stories, whether we are uh, in Odia or in English, once you get started, you can't simply stop. You know, there are many story writers in Odia or in English, you begin after the first paragraph, you drop the story. You know, it doesn't engage me. I have uh, uh, one story in mind which I read in Odia uh, yesterday. Uh, from one of the older magazines and then, then I read it in English translation. The Different Man, Anya Loka. It is a wonderful story, you know, I love my guts out. It is, it's so humorous in so many ways and much of the humor derives from the way you, uh, you play with the Odia language and the way you uh, point new words in situations uh, like those. You know, there are some very interesting brass strokes. There are about five or six characters. Uh, there is one group of uh, young uh, smokers. Wonderful. And when I read the same story in English translation, I feel that you know, maybe you know, the word play that one finds in the Odia original uh, doesn't uh, come out as clearly in the English uh, translation, of course. And then, uh, as a test, I asked uh, one of my students who doesn't know Odia, uh, who hasn't uh, read the Odia original, to read the same story. And I was amazed to discover that he enjoyed it as much as I had enjoyed it in uh, original Odia. So, what is that magic about language? Uh, that, on the one hand, uh, a, a bilingual reader, you are, you are always called a bilingual author, but we are also bilingual, trilingual readers, we read the Hindi, Bangla, languages and English of course. And then we immediately compare the original with the English translation. We don't do that when we read say Garcia Marquez. We don't do that when we uh, read um, uh, say Paul Coel. We don't, we don't try to find out what it was like in the original. But the moment we read something in English translation from one of the Indian languages, we start comparing them and we say okay, look okay, here, this is how it is in Odia and the, the translation is not very good. In your preface, you have yourself said that there are many good writers, wonderful writers in uh, Indian languages. Unfortunately, the translations are not good enough. Uh, and therefore, they are not appreciated as much as they deserve to be appreciated. So, you know, from your own experience, from your own experience, The living deity behind all the languages is the same, but certainly there are differences in articulation, the methods of articulation which have evolved through centuries. 
over the centuries. So when I write, as I you know very well, I do not translate one story from Korea to English or English to Korea. When the necessity has come to write a story from English, suppose my English magazine has wanted a story from me, that line, I give a story. Yes. Sir, could you please uh, give me a minute? Uh, uh, I'll just read out something that you have said on the subject. I think uh, uh, that will uh, uh, illustrate the point that uh, Professor Das is trying to make. Um, when I am recreating my own story, I am not translating. I am only presenting the same inspiration in another God. I have the freedom to change it here and there, to improve upon it or to alter something which the translator, that is another translator, cannot. That is why I like translating my own work, which is very different in the other cases. That's right. That's absolutely right. You have made my position very clear. And also, since English has its own nuances, Korea has its own nuances, I try to forget what I have written in the first language of my story and then I remember the prose alone and the spirit alone and I rewrite it again. So that is how and my hold over English I do not think is that massive and man I used to that. I was never a scholar. I started going to English. I never read in English medium school. By my, my introduction to English alphabet began when I studied to class 5 already and in my early teens. But one thing is that because I am a slow reader, I have not read many great works in this literature, so I have not been influenced by many. So with my native inspiration, I have molded into this language because I believe that language lends itself to your inspiration when you are respectful for the language. I have respected and loved the language of like English. So English, the spirit behind English language has allowed itself to be handled by me in the way I have wanted it to be handled. So that way, as you have very importantly observed today, it is important for students who are doing scholars who are doing comparative studies by English and Korean writing that why you have enjoyed because you grow both English and Korea so well. You have enjoyed my Korea version of story quite much and your student who does not know Korea has enjoyed the English version of the story that much. That is the secret is English language has lent itself to be handled in the way I have liked it. You know, I don't remember uh, Professor Das, I don't remember which uh, story I read this in. This is about a Baba in Haridwar. Uh, who the narrator says, uh, you know, describes him in a particular way. The way, he, you know, he wears a loincloth and the rest of his body is smeared in ashes and all that. Then the narrator describes him as someone who is invariably angry, uh, angry with people, and when he's angry with people, he calls them. He calls everyone uh, Gadha, Gadha in Odia. And uh, when he is particularly pleased with one, he calls him monkey, Mankara, Mankara. Now, I laughed when I read it in Odia. But again, I read out the same lines to a student who doesn't know any Odia. I said, Odia is very funny, well, listen to me. So I read it out. Monkey, a donkey, and then monkey. He also laughed as much as I had. <laughs> you know, there are many such instances where uh, the Odia word, uh, words are beautifully uh, translated into English expressions and the humor is not lost, nor is the pathos of uh, you know, the, you know, the, the uh, evocative uh, uh, the sense of uh, mystery, of, you know, whatever. All these uh, wonderful uh, aspects of your writing, lessons of your writing. So I think uh, uh, we must congratulate you for having uh, uh, accomplished, you know, something uh, uh, extraordinarily, uh, something like an extraordinary challenge to translate your work into English. And yet, 
not call it a translation. You say that you know you do a similar thing when you are quote unquote translating your word from English to Odia. So you know this this uh, success on your part is, is what uh, celebrating. I have a couple of other uh, questions. Um, uh, yes, ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, this one of the usual questions that uh, come to come to our mind. All of us know that uh, in the first uh, phase of your life, when you were a young man, when you were part of uh, you know youth politics, you, know, you were a left wing activist, you went to the Bangalore conference and so on and so forth. And uh, there was a, uh, a phase in your writing when critical of the feudal system in a way from a Marxist point of view. And this is again a very academic question, pardon me sir. I mean, you know, we, uh, we can't avoid asking such questions in academic uh, enterprise. And then uh, from roughly mid-1960s when you moved to Dharma uh, from the northern side, from the materialist Marxist to the spiritual of Buddha. Transition. Now, only because we know what it, we try to uh, figure out, ferret out where is the Marxist monoda, where is the Arvinda monoda. So it's very difficult. So it has proved to be uh, impossible to figure out. And uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, a moralist in, in you as the author, but. What Bhaktin says, you know, the great Russian critic says, you know, it's not a monologic kind of didactism. You don't present anything as the fact or the ethical or the right. You present situations and we know that there is a lot to learn from these situations. Sometimes you don't even know what to learn, but there is a, a, a moment of revelation as leaders. We know, okay. This is why it's happening. But you never impose that uh, solution. It's very similar to what happens in these uh, uh, situations, uh, stories with an element of history. The narrator himself doesn't know, doesn't want to solve those mysteries. He presents them and he shares and rejoices in that sense of undecidability, what it is. I really uh, uh, always uh, marvel at your capacity to do it. Whereas most writers are didactic. They say this is what has happened and this is what you should do. This is what distinguishes a very great writer from a great writer. So you please say something about it. You know, it's a, uh, uh, I may have confused you, but I hope you have... Uh, you have not confused me at all, Professor Subhanu Sarpati. How much I wish that you wrote all my stories with these couple of the cases of years. <laughs> because it is not for any critic to feel these subtleties which I believe there are in my stories. I don't give any credit to me for that. They are given up by inspiration. It is true that I never try to die be didactic for anything. Yes, there is a series of my stories called Evolution Fantasies for Adults. Now available in a book called The Lady Who Died One and a Half Times and Other Fantasies. Now there, what I have done is, in, as a child I used to hear stories from Panchatantra, Kathasarit Sagara. They were enchanting stories and never, never have I come out of their influence. But sometimes I wondered, in Panchatantra, suppose you know the story, a turtle has become very ambitious, he wants to fly. And he has befriended two heroes who somehow hold a stick between themselves and the turtle is, is meant to flee. But they have advised him, don't talk. But when the heroes are flying, the swans are flying, with the turtle is hanging from the stick, people below, people of the, of the earth are amazed and they start making hula ball. The proud daughter is said, How about they wonder at me and he will fulfill them? The story ends there. 
Suddenly I wonder what happened thereafter. So I have built up a story after that. Some of these stories are also there in this volume, the last section. Now there, of course, I have always carried the message forward because there was already a message. So I have carried forward the message, but that is consistent done and that is not one of my original inspired stories, but an invented story, though the task of inspiration. Now when it comes to my original stories, as you know, I was once a Marxist. Now I believe in Sri Aurobindo. I believe in Sri Aurobindo. I believe that human beings are the future. I believe that man is an evolving being. One day the earth will become the spirit's manifest hope. But never it has occurred to me that I should bring this into my stories or my things. Because fiction is its own dharma. My personal faith is its own dharma. My personal faith can sustain me, continue to write in a world full of so much of violence, treachery, and hypocrisy that one can still believe that your inspired writing is appreciated. That is because of my faith in the ultimate destiny of mankind. But I do not bring this faith into my world. But naturally, in some of my stories and particularly my novels, all my novels are not done in English. My Cyclones is there, and Tiger and Twilight is there, Escapist is there. In a novel like Escapist, you will find the indirect impact of my faith, but the spontaneously. It is not transplanted. It is not artificially imposed on anybody. Because what right an author has to give a lesson to the reader? If he himself is a vehicle of some higher inspiration, he can only present the inspiration to the best of his ability, to the best of his mastery over the language, over the style. But he has no right to become a teacher if his work automatically works out in somebody's consciousness as a helpful direction in some way, in some, a helpful light in some direction. Then the original inspiration is to be given the credit for it, not the right answer. So that is there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Professor Das, uh, for this particular answer, uh, which many of us have been looking for. And if this conversation is ever uh, seen as a success, I feel that you know this particular answer uh, is uh, you know uh, uh, something bringing on a revelation for many of our readers. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a couple of small questions. Uh, do you have the time? You know. If anybody wants to ask. Yeah, uh, just one question, maybe one more question. Uh, you began by writing poetry uh, and you say in the preface that uh, poetry should be written only in the mother tongue. Uh, no poetry can be written in uh, any other language other than uh, English. Uh, then, uh, after uh, the first few collections, I don't think you Poetry uh, what uh, weaned you away from poetry? But what weaned you away from poetry is the question that I've been on. What took you away from poetry? What took you away from poetry? Oh, what took me away from poetry? Well, the muse deserted me, what can I do? <laughs> if the inspiration doesn't feed me, you see, it is be very frank. As I have, I have already written in my preface to this book, that I consider myself, and I still consider myself to be a poet, basically. And I still continue to write poetry, maybe once in five years, one in two years, one in three years. But I don't believe in quantity as a whole. In general, why should one go writing a lot? The good work, the good art is not lacking in good literature, if we know how to trace them. So why should a single writer write a lot? So that is one reason. To be very frank, so much of artificiality came into what is known as modern poetry that I feel sometimes my poem is an untouchable. Absolutely. As if it doesn't find a companionship, it doesn't find an environment where it could also dazzle me. So that is why 
subconsciously I disappoint. I should not, I should not have disappointed. But then I must confess my weakness, that was my weakness. But I really believe that poetry can best be written in one's mother tongue because that is the language in which one begins to dream. The subconscious gets it, responds, the power of responding to the world through that language. Because around the child, mother, father, guardians, servants, cousins, aunts, aunties, all are speaking in worry. The vibration of this language, these words, the sound, they are imprinted in his subconscious. So the poetry to be really subtle, it is best written in one's mother tongue. There are exceptions, great exceptions, the greatest exception probably is Sri Aurobindo, because for whom Bengali was not his mother tongue, technically it was, but he did not know Bengali at all. He was born in Bhutan in this environment, right from his infancy, and that is why the mightiest epic Savitri was born. And what a language, what a blessings for English language. Anyway, it's a different matter altogether. Thank you very much, Professor Satsuki. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving your time to answering uh, all these questions. Some of them are silly, but again, uh, this is a moment of celebration. Uh, congratulations to MPT, congratulations to Professor Das, congratulations to all the readers of his work. Uh, it's because of writers like Manoj Das that uh, you know the book industry will uh, continue to flourish. We can't complain of uh, lack of readership if we produce uh, uh, uninteresting literature. As long as we have writers like uh, Professor Das, uh, book publishing will continue and there will be more and more readers. Thank you. He has a question. Your script is asking you a question. <laughs> You have, you have the first right to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Being a former student. I, yeah. I want to ask you two or three questions. First, to what extent or how far there is a noticeable influence of Gurudev Rajinath Tagore in your stories. Apart from your personal influences, I am sure somewhere Gurudev's influence is there. Probably the very source from which Tagore got his inspiration, I also got my inspiration. I have not been consciously influenced by him. I have been consciously influenced by the two epics, Savan Mahabharata, by Vishnu Sarma and Samadeva, Panchati Prasad Sagaro, and the father of God Moria Cruz. Okay, in Oriya language. In English, the only consistent influence on me is Shakespeare, and the greatest influence is Sri Bindu, which came much later. But there must have been subtle influences of so many writers. Professor Satpati mentioned William Saroyan. I was delighted. Saroyan is my favorite of his Once I read Saroyan, like anything, very few people I have read, I have not read much. But Saravan was my, one of my best great writers. So, subconscious influences may be there, but not conscious influences. And the last question What is the process of writing a story? Is it spontaneous or does it descend? Or you take time? Or is there any period of incubation and suddenly you begin to write? Ah, what is the mechanism? <laughs> Again, he works to reveal my, or anybody's trade secret. <laughs> you see, for every writing, I am not speaking of myself. I am speaking of writing as a whole. Any piece of writing which is worth remembering, or which is worth remembering, the inspiration comes from one creative world from which the inspiration for a power comes, the inspiration for a Raga Ragini comes. You cannot materially simply poo poo the idea of inspiration. There is a source from which everything comes. 
So once that drop of inspiration comes, it begins gathering the elements with the help of which it can become a sound, a message, a vibration and an impact. Now so, basically, for any visible last 15, almost 20 years, I haven't written a single story. You can imagine how much of demands I get from my readers, new story, please give new story. I tell them that it is easy for me to invent a story. And un un unless that's a very discerning reader, like Professor Satwati, he would be able to say which one is an inspired story, which one is an inventive story. But why should I? As I said, the Buddha does not like a good stories. I have written over 200 stories, and hundreds of which, of which are there in his book. So, that's enough. So, the inspiration is the essential secret of impact of a story. If the story you read and you don't forget, even if you forget temporarily, it will strike back 10 years later, 20 years later, a different environment. Then this is inspired story. And suddenly, you have to gather elements, like Pancha Bhutto, our soul has five elements, physical elements, but they can they cannot be the introduction to my spirit. They cannot be the identity of my soul. They are the container of my soul. They are the vehicle of my soul. So like that, the material, environmental elements become the raw material which contains the essential core of the story. Why should there be two monodas at all? Since the time, since the beginning of creation, scientifically speaking, two blades of grass, two leaves have not been exactly the same. And so, it is nature resources in variety, in multiplicity, and so monodas is just one of the billion phenomena as you are. So, I do not think that apart from nature, anybody can say what is the secret of either me or, or, or of you. It is the ultimate consciousness which knows. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We come to the end of this very engaging conversation that we are having. I am sure this conversation is, we can continue over tea and even after that. Uh, for a for a formal vote of thanks, I will request our editor of Hindi, Dr. Bishop Mandura, who is also looking after all the programs happening here at the site in Ash. And you can also buy copies of this book and get it signed by the author. It is right here. Some copies are available for sale. Thank you. You should sign my copy.